together forever. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21, 4, King James Version. My sweet aunt, Irene Tootie Pennington, passed away from cancer the same year of the Nashville flood. It really took its toll on mom because they were so close. Before Tootie got sick, she'd come by mom's house every day and check on her. Tootie was my mom's favorite sister, even though they fussed at each other. When I was a child and through my adult years, Tootie would always come over for the holidays. She always supported me and loved me like her own child. She loved Evan the same way. When she passed and we went over to her apartment to clear out her things, I found pictures of me and Evan all over her house. Mom didn't make a big deal out of it while Tootie was sick, but she found out that the endometrial cancer that she had had years before was back. She had surgery to remove a small malignant tumor in her uterus back then, and the doctor assured her that he thought he got it all. But I guess that wasn't the case. Mom didn't want to worry everybody. Now Mom was faced with having to get radiation to try to battle it. It worried me and my brother Greg. Mom acted like she was completely fine. She said she had plenty of friends that would take her to get the treatments. Greg offered to take her since he was only one town away, but she said she'd manage. I had taken several years off from touring to be at home with Lisa and Evan and be able to go see Mom. Mom would also have some of her friends drive her down every now and then so she could stay with us. While visiting her in Ohio, she wanted me to go with her to see the doctor in Cincinnati. It was just the two of us. Lisa and Evan stayed at Mom's house. Evidently, the doctor had previously ordered some testing and Mom was getting the results that day. The doctor told her that the tumor was growing, but it was still very small. He explained that it was nothing really to worry about, but she'd need to have some tests done regularly to make sure it wasn't growing too fast. He even said, Jackie, at your age, you'd more likely die of some other ailment than this tumor. The results didn't sit well with me at all. I felt we should get a second opinion. My last experience with doctors in Cincinnati didn't go well, and I didn't want to take that chance again. I asked Mom if she'd be okay if we saw some doctors in Tennessee to get their opinions about her cancer. She agreed, and within several weeks, she was staying with us in Franklin. I scheduled an appointment for her to see a surgeon at Vanderbilt Hospital that specializes in cancer surgery. She was supposed to be the best at what she did. The surgeon requested for the doctor in Cincinnati to send all of Mom's test results for her to review. After she reviewed the tests, Mom and I had a meeting with her. The lady was very kind and very to the point. She told Mom that she not only needed radiation, but she needed chemotherapy immediately. The doctor in Cincinnati was completely wrong. The new doctor believed that it was a very serious situation. Mom and I both shed tears in the doctor's office. Our worst fear had come to life. I discussed the gravity of Mom's condition with Lisa and we decided that it'd be best if Mom moved in for a while until she went through chemo. There's no way I would have let Mom go through fighting cancer alone in Fairfield. Mom was always there for me and I was going to be there for her. Thankfully, Mom agreed to move in with us. We took a trip to Fairfield to get everything she would need for a long stay and made sure her house was secure while she was away. My brother Greg was a bundle of nerves. So were Mom's friends and other family members. It was a very stressful time for everyone involved. We loaded up all of Mom's essentials and headed back to Tennessee. For the next several months, Mom received chemotherapy at a cancer clinic just down the street from where we lived in Cool Springs. The facility and staff were so professional and kind. Overall, Mom was so incredibly strong while having to sit there and have that stuff pumped into her veins. She also had to endure the radiation treatments that would make her nauseous. At times, the combination of the two was almost too much for her. The doctor ordered some new x-rays after a couple months of treatment, and the results were horrifying. She said that the cancer not only grew, but it had started to spread. I came apart at the seams. I was so anxious that I found it hard to function. Mom wasn't dealing with it too well either. She was getting sicker by the day. The worst part for Mom was losing her hair. She was always such a beautiful lady and she didn't like anyone to see her that way. She'd wear bandanas on her head to hide the hair loss. While at home, Mom was constantly sick to her stomach because of the chemo. She grew weaker and weaker. 
The one positive thing that came out of mom staying with us was that Evan was able to really get to know her better. On the days mom felt good, they'd have so much fun together. They had a game that they would play where they'd chase each other around the house. Mom would also sit and color in Evan's coloring books with him and tell him stories. She was so gentle with him, and he'd smile from ear to ear when she was around. Mom's doctor asked to have a private meeting with me one day, and I had a terrible feeling about it. She told me that she felt Mom only had between six months and a year left. There was not much more she could do. My heart sank. I asked whether or not Mom should continue to have her treatments, and she said that was up to us. She said it might extend her life a little, but it wouldn't cure her. When I left the building... I felt numb. I didn't know what I was going to say to mom. In fact, when I got home, I didn't say anything. I needed Lisa's opinion and think about how I was going to break the news to my sweet and beautiful mother. I finally gathered enough strength to sit mom down and tell her the news. After I told her what the doctor said, we both sobbed. I couldn't stand the thought of my mom having to deal with the pain of dying. I asked her if she wanted to continue the chemo and she said yes. She wanted to have as much time with us as possible. It broke my heart. Her condition continued to deteriorate rapidly. I had to take her to the emergency room several times. Her pain had become a big issue, and we had to get some heavy-duty pain medicine for her. The medication needed to be administered every four hours for it to work effectively. I remember setting my alarm clock to go in and help my mom take her medicine. She reached the point where I had to call my brother Greg for him to come down and visit. I didn't know how much longer she was going to be with us. The six months that the doctor gave us had turned into three months. And to add to the stress, we found out that my cousin Sharon in Ohio was terminally sick. It was all just too much to take. I would lay awake at night praying that God would give me peace and strength. I talked to him in my mind like a friend. Lisa was so busy making sure Evan was taken care of that I didn't want to burden her with more than what she was already dealing with. God was the only one I went to. He was my shelter. Mom and I were able to discuss all of her wishes with me when the time came for her to cross over. She was able to sit with Greg to do the same thing. Even though it was extremely difficult to talk through the things that would need to be taken care of, it was a blessing to be able to do so. Mom eventually got to the point of having morphine on a drip. She was in extreme pain all the time. She told me that it was time for her to go to hospice. She had endured all she could, and she was ready to meet her maker. She didn't want to die in the house with Evan there. The ambulance came to get her, and I followed it downtown to a section of the hospital that's meant to keep people comfortable while they're dying. The staff was so helpful and sympathetic. I checked Mom in, and they assigned her a room. I sat there alone and waited. I remember thinking that it couldn't get any worse than this. I got to a place in my mind of wanting mom to die because of the pain and suffering she was having to endure. I actually went up to her and whispered in her ear, I love you, mom. It's okay to go. The lady nurse told me it may take several days for her to pass, and if I needed to go back home and take care of anything, it would be okay. I took her advice and headed back to the house to check on Lisa and Evan. I visited mom three or four times and would sit in there for hours watching over her during the next couple of days. The one time that I wasn't at the hospital, the nurse called me and said that mom had just passed away. She told me she was standing beside her when she breathed her final breath. I had missed it once again. I wanted to be the one holding her hand while she crossed over to the other side. But for some reason, mom and dad didn't want me to have to remember that. Maybe they were just in too much pain and just didn't want to wait. Maybe it was just how God wanted it. I don't know. But it was hard for me. Very, very hard. I know that my mom was happy when she saw Jesus, her mom and dad, my dad, her daughter Vanessa, her aunt Tressie, Tootie, and the rest of her family at the gates of heaven. Oh, what a reunion it must have been. She was one of the godliest women that I've ever met. And there's no question she got a fast pass ticket into the promised land. She died September 9, 2012. I'm not sure how I got through transporting mom up to Ohio and for her funeral. Just like with dad, there were so many people that attended. Mom didn't want an open casket. She had joked when she was alive and told me, close me up. 
I don't want anybody walking by me and looking at my old dead body. When packing up her things at the house, I found little sticky notes where she had labeled everything for me. In her handwriting, she let me know who the item should go to. Bless her heart. She knew when she was writing those notes that her days were numbered. It made me smile and cry at the same time. Several months after she passed, I put Dad and Mom's house on the market. I really didn't want to sell it, but I knew that I wouldn't be able to tend to it from Tennessee. I took pictures of every room so I'd remember the last place I grew up. I sold it after just a few days, and I had to go back up to Ohio and move all the furniture out. I gave most of it away to family and took the rest back to Franklin in a U-Haul truck. I couldn't believe it had come to that. Both of my parents and my childhood home were gone. I am weak, he is strong. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for God's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, NIV If your life is like mine, there have been times when I felt drained and exhausted by grief. Life's responsibilities and burdens can literally bring you to your knees. We've all reached the point where we didn't know if we could take another step, right? I've laid in bed with depression. I've been physically ill, but thankfully I'm healthy overall. Imagine having a terminal disease or a lifelong handicap. Life is hard. And you know what? Our culture seems to have no pity on us. Weakness is looked down upon. Our world wants us to hide our emotions and not talk about our disabilities and mental illnesses. They don't want to hear about our doom and gloom. And yet the Bible, and particularly Apostle Paul, advocate Christians to brag about their weaknesses and shortcomings. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7-10 ESV, Paul describes the thorn in his flesh. It says, A thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. To boast? To brag? Whoa, that's a shocker. Imagine if Nike's slogan was, Don't do it. Let God do it instead. (laughs) I don't think that'd fly. God wants us out there talking about our weaknesses. Why? I believe it's because He wants people to know that He comes running when we need Him. You see, instead of God removing the difficult circumstances from Paul's life, he provided a way to overcome it through strengthening Paul. The Bible says, My power is made perfect in weakness. Because of God's perfect design, we can relax and know that God has everything under control. We can lean on Him when times get difficult. As 2 Corinthians 13, 9 NIV says, We are glad whenever we are weak but you are strong, and our prayer is that you may be fully restored.